For millennia, people from different countries, cultures, and backgrounds have found direction and encouragement in the inspired pages of the Bible. In his day, Jesus directed listeners to search the prophecies of Scripture to find Him the only way of salvation. 2,000 years later, as we stand on the break of eternity, we no less need the purpose and hope God's Word provides. Sacramento Central Church brings you Receiving the Word, timely Bible messages presented by pastors Chris Buttery and Mike Thompson. Amazing revelations await you in God's Holy Word, the Bible. So glad you're back to join us for another Receiving the Word message. This is part two of a two-part presentation. If you missed part one, I want to invite you to go to our website, SACCentral, S-A-C, central.org, and click on the Media Resources tab. Have your Bible in hand as we go live now to part two of this timely Bible message. God's will. Have you ever wondered how to know God's will? I mean, there are some very basic questions in life. You know, who do you marry? What, what's your career going to be? What school, college should I attend once graduating from high school? And there are little decisions we make and, in, and other bigger decisions we have to make in life. How do you know God's will? When we go to the prayer of Nehemiah, there are just simple little principles in there that help us know how to know the will of God. Let's read Nehemiah's prayer. It starts in verse 5. It says, And I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you will keep your covenant, your mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments. Please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night, for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which have sinned against you. Both my father's house and I have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. Remember, I pray, the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you were cast out to the farthest part of the heavens, yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Now these are your servants and your people, whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O oh Lord, I pray, please, let your ear be attended to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servant servants who desire to fear your name. And let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. I'm going to just share several things with you here briefly so you can know how to know God's will. First of all, a person who wants to know God's will must first be consecrated to God. Nehemiah in this prayer called himself the Lord's what? Servant. He was consecrated to God. He was God's servant. So a person who wants to know God's will must be consecrated to God. If you want to know God's will, you must have a genuine interest in the welfare of his people. Who is Nehemiah praying for? He's praying that God will help him and bless him, and he's also asking God to, to fulfill his promises, but he's, ultimately it's all for his people. So if you want to know God's will, you need to have a genuine interest in the welfare of God's people. If you want to know God's will, you need to have a concern for God, the cause of God and his honor. You see that also in the prayer of Nehemiah. If you want to know God's will, you need to seek counsel from godly people. Do you see that in verse 11? Let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants. To the prayer of your servants. We need to seek counsel from godly people. If you want to know God's will, you need to be persistent in prayer. Nehemiah prayed four months over this thing. Prayed four months over this thing. If you want to know God's will, you've got to spend time reading God's word and know his will and his word. A half of the prayer is really Nehemiah. His prayer is rooted in the promises of the Bible. That's really what his prayer is rooted in. And then if you want to know God's will, you need to look for God's leading providences. And we'll read more about that in, Rome, uh, in Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 2 through 6, another week. So Nehemiah, he had a burden for God's people. God can use us when we have a burden for God's people. But I want you to notice several things about Nehemiah's burden uh, as we talk here today, Nehemiah's burden was essentially stemmed from sympathy with the people, the people's need, the causes need. His his sympathy, uh, his his burden stemmed from the sympathy for the people. Other Jews back in Babylon probably recognized the need, but they just didn't do anything about it. 
They went back to their work in Babylon thinking, oh, that's a little unfortunate, but they weren't burdened by the need of God's, that God's people had. But the man or the woman that God uses to do something about it not only hears about the need, but they feel the need. And that's what happened with Nehemiah. He felt the need. I'll just go back there, Nehemiah chapter 1 and verse 1. There's an interesting thing that uh, it's easy to slip over, skip over, but let's take a look at it. It says in the 20th year, where was Nehemiah? Where was he? He was in Shushan, where? The citadel. The citadel. Or in other words, he was in a fortified palace. Now, just bear with me for just a quick moment. He was in a fortified palace, and yet, and, and what was happening with the people back in Jerusalem? Were they in a fortified city? They were not in a fortified city at all. As a matter of fact, the, the walls were broken down. Some parts were up, but, you know, some of the, if you just have a fraction of the wall open, enemy can just march right in, can't they? But there was a large portion of the wall that wasn't built. Some stuff needed to be repaired. There his people were in desperate need, and Nehemiah, however, was in a fortified palace. And still, and still, he recognized the need. He could have just become comfortable right there in his fortified palace. I'm okay. I'm fine. I have the truth. I've got it all right here. Everything's good with me. But he looked beyond the fortified palace and he saw a broken down, torn down city. A great, great need. He recognized his he, he had it good. And as a result, he recognized he needed to do something to help those who didn't have it good. Who didn't have it that good at all. The Bible says he wept and he mourned and he fasted and he prayed for days about what he'd heard. He just couldn't put it out of his mind. God uses, used that burden that he placed on Nehemiah's heart as a call for action. God used that burden as a basis for action. And someone might be wondering, well, you know what, Pastor Chris, there's so many needs around us, it's so great, I can't possibly respond to them all. So how do I discern what particular need God wants me to get involved with? Well, keep this in mind. You just, you, what is tempting for us is to just look at the immensity of the, the need around us, and then we become immobilized. We become frozen. It's tempting to hear about needs and then get overwhelmed about the needs and then we go run for cover because there's no way we can respond to them all. Out of emotional survival, some of us throw up a barricade around our hearts and block out anything, any need around us. We busy ourselves in our own pursuits in the hope that we can maybe just shrug it off. What we should do is what Jesus said we should do. We read this in Matthew chapter 9, verses 36 to 39. It says, seeing the people talking about Jesus, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of harvest to send out laborers. You see that? So we when we see it, we need to pray. We, we need to say, God, give me the eyes of Jesus. Help me to see the need of people. Then give me the heart of Jesus to feel compassion for them. And then pray that God will raise up workers to meet those overwhelming needs. And God, I'm available as well. Where do you want me? This is what Jesus asked us to do. So let's not, let's not let the immensity of the needs around us immobilize us. Let's do something. What do you say out there? Secondly, though, don't, be, don't be rash. Don't just rashly commit yourself to something just because there's a need. The, need. the needs are endless. You don't have to respond to everything. Nobody can do that. Rather, wait on God in prayer until he burdens your heart with a particular need that you can do something about. And so we need to pray continually to God that he'll give us a heart to feel the burden of hurting people's needs and the willingness to get involved where we can offer some help. Nehemiah's burden stemmed from the great need, but it also stemmed from the people's sin. Did you see that in his prayer? Nehemiah was realistic in assessing the problem that lay before him. He quickly realized that at the heart of things was not a lack of organization, not a lack, simply a lack of resources, although those things were definitely needed. The root problem was sin. The root problem was sin. So he prayed, confessing the sins of his people, but it wasn't just about them. Look at their sins, Lord. 
but they're great. They're many. Just could you, could you forgive their sins? Nehemiah included himself, the humble man, servant of God that he was. God, forgive their sins and mine and my family's sins. The Bible is clear, friends, that at the root of all of our problems lies sin. Why are there wars and terrorist attacks? Sin. Why is there famine and disease? Sin. Why are governments and businesses riddled with greed and corruption? Sin. Why is the mission of the church not fulfilled? It's the same answer, friends. It is sin. It is sin. On the personal level, why do, why do couples argue and have problems communicating? Sin. Why do kids from Christian homes rebel against God and their parents? Sin. If God is going to use us to help alleviate any great need, we need to keep the focus clear that the root problem at all problems is sin, is sin. We all not get distracted, by the way, from the root uh, problem. If we start thinking that the real need is better organization or more funds or better methods, then we're always starting in the wrong place. The root need among God's people is for repentance, for revival, and for ref. Formation. The walls are torn down, friends, and they have not been rebuilt. God, forgive us. Oh, God, arouse us. Oh, God, empower us to do your will. That should be our prayer. What do you say? <laughs> Certainly. Nehemiah's burden stemmed from feeling the people's great need, and it also stemmed from the people's great sin. But Nehemiah's burden was also eased by seeing the people's God. You see that in his prayer, oh, great, great and marvelous God, he says. And if you jump down to verse 10, he uses the words you and your, referring to God, five times in that uh, one verse, as if to say, God, these aren't my people, they're your people. You see, God wants us to feel burden for his people and for others and for his cause, but then he wants us to roll the burden back on him, remembering it is not in our power, but his power that can ultimately help. What do you say? Sure, sure. What if you honestly don't have a burden for God's cause? What happens if you don't have a burden for lost people for that matter? What does that mean? What should you do? It could mean that you need to be renewed by the Holy Spirit. You need to get on your knees and say, God, God, help me to see the need, change my heart. If that's your condition, you need to go to God, you need to tell him all about it. It could also mean that you've become burdened just simply with the wrong things. Instead of being burdened for souls, burdened for the cause of Christ, you become burdened and, and, and weighed down by, by bills uh, or, or problems in your own life, whatever they might be. And I don't mean to minimize those things, but Jesus said, just come unto me and I'll give you rest. Peter said, cast all your cares upon me for I care about you. God wants us to be burdened about the right things. What do you say? We need to go, go to God and ask him to line up our priorities correctly. He doesn't save us so that we can just simply live happy lives. He saves us so that we can, he can use us further for his purpose. And that brings us to the second quality of a person that God uses. A person that God uses has a vision for his purpose, for God's purpose. Let me ask you a quick question. Why does God save people? Be careful how you answer. Why does God save people? <laughs> well, he loves us and he wants us to be happy. That, 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 that is partially true. Well, he, it, it's true, but it's not the full answer. I'll put it that way. There you go. Excuse me. He loves us, certainly. And he died for us, certainly. And, and Christianity brings great satisfaction and happiness to the life. No question about that at all. But it isn't the whole story. It's not the whole story. Saving people is a means toward God's purpose. And God's purpose, uh, I should say, in saving people is not the end of God's purpose. Let's read about his purpose. God's purpose, go to Ephesians chapter 1 here. Ephesians chapter 1, we'll just jump over to the New Testament. God's purpose involves building his church for the sake of his name and his Glory, Ephesians chapter 1, and we'll read verse 10 through 12. He wants to essentially display the riches of his grace and his manifold wisdom through the church to the entire universe. That's what God wants to do. His plan isn't just to save us. His plan is to save us for a purpose. 
to glorify his name. Notice what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 10 through 12, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the what, friends? The praise of his glory. You see, Jesus called us, the Bible says right here, Jesus called us according to the counsel of his will, and those of us who first trusted in, in him, he has asked that we would live a life that brings praise to his glory. That's what the Bible says there. Isn't that powerful? That's what, that's what we've called for God's chief purpose is to further his own glory through the experience of his people, to testify in their lives to his goodness and his grace. Why? Because he's countering the devilish lies of the devil. That's why. And a lot of people are believing the devil's lives, but through the people of God, God wants to declare who he really is. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that a glorious enterprise? A cause you can get excited about and involved in? Oh man, great God that we serve. But the, ball, but the walls are broken down. And there's no difference sometimes between God's people and the world. And when that happens, God isn't glorified. When God's people think the same as the world, when God's people hold values the same as the world, counter to the Word of God. And when God's people relate to God and to one another, the same as the world, instead of glorifying God's name, we bring reproach upon God. How we live, how we live matters. And so God, God is looking for those who have a burden for His people, His cause, and also uh, a, a vision for His purpose. And finally, finally, the person God uses is committed to His plans committed to his plans. Nehemiah didn't hear about the sand condition in Jerusalem and say, well, that's too bad. I hope somebody else gets around to dealing with that because that'd just be too much of a sacrifice for me. Rather, he was willing to commit himself to the task and to stick with it in spite of the difficulties. He persisted through the problems. As a matter, when we get into more of the book of Nehemiah later on, we're going to find there were countless problems that Nehemiah had to deal with. One obstacle after another. There was overt and covert opposition from the enemy. There was problems even within the church that he had to deal with. But Nehemiah persisted until he completed that wall in 52 days. You see, if you try to do anything in God's service, the fact is you'll face opposition as well and obstacles. Some of it will come from the world, but the most difficult opposition often comes within the church. You have to realize up front that when you encounter problems and commit yourself to God, You'll encounter problems when you commit yourself to God and endure in His plan and to continue to serve in His plan. But I want you to notice also Nehemiah's commitment didn't involve just persisting through the problems, but he went from the lap of luxury to living for God. Nehemiah lived in the palace in Shushan with the king. Excavations have shown that, the, that it was built of cedar, of gold, of silver, and of ivory. And the walls were decorated with artistically colored glazed bricks and relief designs of winged bulls. Nehemiah would have eaten the best food. Nehemiah could have worn and probably wore the best clothes. And no doubt he lived in very comfortable quarters. No doubt about that. It was pretty cushy. But when he heard about the distress of God's people and the dishonor to God's name, Nehemiah couldn't be happy in that luxurious surrounding. He was willing to give it all up and make that difficult journey down to Jerusalem and to set about the difficult job of mobilizing God's people to rebuild the wall so that God's name would be honored among his people. Was it a costly sacrifice for Nehemiah? Yes and no. <laughs> yes and no. Yes, he had to give up all those comforts for the lot of hardship and difficulty. But no. No, in that he could no longer be happy doing what he's doing. He'd found great joy in doing what God wanted him to do. And so like Moses before, he esteemed the reproach of Christ greater than the riches 
of uh, treasures in Egypt. And like Paul, he counted it all rubbish so that he might gain Jesus Christ. That was Nehemiah's focus. So it was a sacrifice, but then, then, then again, no, 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 it wasn't. It wasn't a sacrifice at all. Oh, friends, when we serve the Lord, we must be committed to his plan. God is looking for individuals. God is looking for individuals who'll have a, a passion for his purpose and a passion for his people and his cause, a vision for his purpose, and to be committed to his plan. And that commitment comes from the, the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives, an intimate connection to Jesus Christ. These are the people whom God wants to use in these last days to build up the walls. I'd like to close in telling you a story, a story of a missionary. And um, I'm going to put a, we'll put a slide up on the screen for you here. If you draw a, a straight line from Honolulu, Hawaii, all the way down to Sydney, Australia, it'll cut right through Port Villa, which is the capital of what is today called Vanuatu. Vanuatu. If you go about two-thirds of the way down that line from Hawaii, you'll get there. Those are what used to be called the New Hebrides. The New Hebrides. And they were given the name by Captain James Cook, one of the founders of, a, of Australia, in the 18th century because they looked to him like the Hebrides Islands off the coast of Scotland. Today, Vanuatu has about 270,000 inhabitants on 80 islands, and not all of the islands are inhabited, but most of them are. And as far as we know, there was no Christian influence among the New Hebrides until 1839. Can't be sure, but that's kind of the information that we have. The first missionaries to land on the island of the New Hebrides, within minutes of going on shore, were clubbed to death, were cooked, and then eaten in the face of the ship that had brought them there. John Patton and his wife gave up the comforts of their Scottish home, the relationship with their loved ones, and he had a successful urban ministry. He was a preacher to take the gospel to the cannibals in the New Hebrides in 1858. He was 33 years old. He was going to build up the wall among the natives in the New Hebrides. But like anyone who gets involved in wall building, he faced challenges. Just four months after arriving, his wife and their son, newborn son, died of the fever. He served alone on that island for the next four years under incredible circumstances, constant danger until he was driven off the island. So for the next four years, he mobilized mission work to the New Hebrides, traveling around Australia, also went to Great Britain. He married in, again in 1864, and he took his wife, Margaret, back, this time to one of the smaller islands, Anawa. Anawa was seven miles by two miles, just a very small, tiny little island. And when they came to Anawa in November 1866, they saw the destitution of the islanders. The natives were cannibals, and occasionally ate the flesh of their defeated foes. They practiced infanticide, widow sacrifices. They killed their widows uh, because the deceased men, so they could serve the deceased men in the afterlife, you see. Their worship was entirely a service of fear, its aim being to satisfy this or that evil spirit, to prevent uh, calamity or to secure revenge. They de deified their chiefs so that almost villa every village or tribe had its own <clears throat> sacred man. They also worshipped the spirits of departed ancestors and heroes, and they did that through material idols of wood and of stone. Patton admitted at times whether they would accept the gospel in their consciousness, in their lives. But he took heart regarding the power of the gospel and from the fact that thousands in nearby islands had given their lives to Jesus, so he stayed on. So he learned the language and he reduced it down into writing. He built orphanages, training young people for Jesus. They trained the teachers, translated, printed, and expounded the Bible, ministered to the sick and dying, dispensed medicines every day, and they even taught the folk how to use tools. They held worship services every week and sent native teachers across the village to share and to spread and teach the gospel. In the next 15 years, John and Margaret Patton saw the entire island of Anawa turn to Jesus. 
Years later, he wrote this. He said, I claimed Anawa for Jesus, and by the grace of God, Anawa now worships at the Savior's feet. When he was 73 years old and traveling around the world, trumpeting the cause of missions in the South Seas, he was still ministering to his beloved Anawan people and published the New Testament in the Anawan language in 1897. Even to his death, he was translating hymns and he, cr- he was creating a dictionary for the people, even though he couldn't be with them anymore. Patton, he outlived his second wife by two years and he died in Australia on January 28, 1907. Patton faced incredible opposition challenges even before he left. He was told, cannibals, you'll, if you go there, you'll be eaten by cannibals. But to this, Patton responded, and listen very carefully. It was to an elderly gentleman. He said, you are advanced in years now, and your own prospect is soon to be laid in the grave. A very careful way of saying, you'll be dead and gone soon, buddy. Um, But your prospect is soon to be laid in the grave, there to be eaten by worms. I confess to you that if I can live, that if I can but live and die serving and honoring the Lord Jesus, It will make no difference to me whether I'm eaten by cannibals or by worms. And in the great day of the resurrection, I will rise as fair in likeness as yours and my Savior, the risen Savior, our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Talk about about a passion for the cause of Christ. Talk about uh, aligning himself with the vision of God's purpose for this world, for the cause of Christ. I want to challenge us today. I want to challenge us today. You don't have to go to Anawa. You don't have to go to the other side of the globe to be a missionary for Jesus, to build up walls. There are walls that need to be built up right here. Some of your homes' walls need to be built up. In the church here, walls need to be built up. Our community desperately needs walls to be built up. Desperately. And God is looking for Nehemiahs in this last day, in these last days, to serve him with faithfulness, to serve him with courage, to serve him with passion and with vision and purpose. Don't settle for just uh, having a, a safe and happy retirement. You know, we live our lives living for retirement. Have you noticed that? Everything's about retirement and retirement. Then in retirement, you can do everything you wanted. But then all you're doing is you're spending all your money you saved for, for regaining the health that you lost while you're making all that money. Have you ever figured that out? I want to challenge you today. Don't, don't be thinking about that, that mobile home, whatever they call those things, on four wheels, traveling to all the national parks throughout the United States, capturing everything now on your camera, on your phone. Don't be thinking about that. Ask God to put you, your, a burden for his people, for his cause, a vision for his purpose, a commitment to his plan on your heart. And like Patton, and like Nehemiah, be used of God for a cause that is worth living for and a cause that is worth dying for. May God help us. We're so glad you decided to tune in to today's Receiving the Word program. If you have a special prayer request, we would be happy to pray about it for you. To discover more about the Bible through our free online Bible studies or to listen to more life-changing Bible messages, go to saccentral.org and click on the Media Resources tab. If you've been blessed or encouraged by our ministry and God impresses you to support us, then visit our website or write to us at 6045 Camellia Avenue, Sacramento, California, 95819. Always gladly receive God's Word.